Chapter 7 of Leviathan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Chapter 7 of The Ends or Resolutions of Discourse. Of all discourse, governed by desire of knowledge, there is at last an end, either by attaining or by giving over, and in the chain of discourse, wheresoever it be interrupted, there is an end for that time. If the discourse be merely mental, it consisteth of thoughts that the thing will be and will not be, or that it has been and has not been alternately. So wheresoever you break off the chain of a man's discourse, you leave him in a presumption of it will be, or it will not be, or it has been, or has not been, all which is opinion, and that which is alternate appetite, in deliberating concerning good and evil, the same is alternate opinion in the inquiry of the truth of past and future and as the last appetite in deliberation is called the will, so the last opinion in search of the truth of past and future is called the judgment, or resolute and final sentence of him that discourseth. And as the whole chain of appetites alternate in the question of good or bad is called deliberation, so the whole chain of opinions alternate in the question of true or false, is called doubt. No discourse whatsoever can end in absolute knowledge of fact, past or to come. For, as for the knowledge of fact, it is originally sense, and ever after memory. And for the knowledge of consequence, which I have said before is called science, it is not absolute, but conditional. No man can know by discourse that this or that is, has been, or will be, which is to know absolutely, but only that if this be, that is, if this has been, that has been, if this shall be, that shall be, which is to know conditionally, and that not the consequence of one thing to another, but of one name of a thing to another name of the same thing. And therefore, when the discourse is put into speech, and begins with the definitions of words, and proceeds by connection of the same into general affirmations, and these again into syllogisms, the end or last sum is called the conclusion, and the thought of the mind by it signified is that conditional knowledge, or knowledge of the consequence of words, which is commonly called science. But if the first ground of such discourse be not definitions, or if the definitions be not rightly joined together into syllogisms, then the end or conclusion is again opinion, namely of the truth of somewhat said, though sometimes in absurd and senseless words, without possibility of being understood. When two or more men know of one and the same fact, they are said to be conscious of it one to another, which is as much as to know it together. And because such are fittest witnesses of the facts of one another, or of a third, it was and ever will be reputed a very evil act for any man to speak against his conscience, or to corrupt or force another so to do, insomuch that the plea of conscience has been always hearkened unto very diligently in all times. Afterwards men made use of the same word metaphorically for the knowledge of their own secret facts and secret thoughts, and therefore it is rhetorically said that the conscience is a thousand witnesses. And last of all, men, vehemently in love with their own new opinions, 
though never so absurd, and obstinately bent to maintain them, gave those their opinions also, that reverenced, name of conscience, as if they would have it seem unlawful to change or speak against them, and so pretend to know they are true, when they know at most but that they think so. When a man's discourse beginneth not at definitions, it beginneth either at some contemplation of his own, and then it is still called opinion, or it beginneth at some saying of another, of whose ability to know the truth, and of whose honesty in not deceiving, he doubteth not, and then the discourse is not so much concerning the thing as the person, and the resolution is called belief and faith. Faith in the man, belief both of the man and of the truth of what he says. So that in belief are two opinions, one of the saying of the man, the other of his virtue. To have faith in or trust to, to believe a man, signify the same thing, namely an opinion of the veracity of the man. But to believe what is said signifieth only an opinion of the truth of the saying. But we are to observe that this phrase I believe in, as also the Latin credo in, and the Greek piseno eis, are never used but in the writings of divines. Instead of them, in other writings are put, I believe him, I trust him, I have faith in him, I rely on him. And in Latin, credo ili, fido ili, and in Greek, piseno anto. And that this singularity of the ecclesiastic use of the word hath raised many disputes about the right object of the Christian faith. But by believing in, as it is in the creed, is meant not trust in the person, but confession and acknowledgement of the doctrine. For not only Christians, but all manner of men, do so believe in God, as to hold all for truth they hear him say, whether they understand it or not, which is all the faith and trust can possibly be had in any person whatsoever. But they do not believe the doctrine of the creed, from whence we may infer that when we believe any saying, whatsoever it be, to be true, from arguments taken, not from the thing itself, or from the principles of natural reason, but from the authority and good opinion we have of him that hath said it, then is the speaker or person we believe in or trust in, and whose word we take, the object of our faith, and the honour done in believing is done to him only. And consequently, when we believe that the scriptures are the word of God, having no immediate revelation from God himself, our belief, faith and trust is in the church, whose word we take and acquiesce therein. And they that believe that which a prophet relates unto them in the name of God, take the word of the prophet, do honour to him, and in him trust and believe, touching the truth of what he relateth, whether he be a true or a false prophet. And so it is also with all other history, for if I should not believe all that is written by historians of the glorious acts of Alexander or Caesar, I do not think the ghost of Alexander or Caesar had any just cause to be offended or anybody else but the historian. If Livy says the gods made once a cow speak, and we believe it not, we distrust not God therein, but Livy. So that it is evident that whatsoever we believe, upon no other reason than what is drawn from authority of men only and their writings, whether they be sent from God or not, is faith in men only. End of chapter 7 Recorded by Gesine in January 2007
Chapter Eight of Leviathan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, Chapter Eight of the Virtues Commonly Called Intellectual and Their Contrary Defects. Virtue generally, in all sorts of subjects, is somewhat that is valued for eminence, and consisteth in comparison. For if all things were equally in all men, nothing would be prized. And by virtues intellectual are always understood such abilities of the mind as men praise, value, and desire should be in themselves, and go commonly under the name of a good wit, though the same word, wit, be used also to distinguish one certain ability from the rest. These virtues are of two sorts, natural and acquired. By natural I mean not that which a man hath from his birth, for that is nothing else but sense, wherein men differ so little one from another, and from brute beasts, as it is not to be reckoned amongst virtues. But I mean that wit which is gotten by use only, and experience, without method, culture, or instruction. This natural wit consisteth principally in two things, celerity of imagining, that is, swift succession of one thought to another, and steady direction to some approved end. On the contrary, a slow imagination maketh that defect or fall to the mind, which is commonly called dullness, stupidity, and sometimes by other names that signify slowness of motion, or difficulty to be moved. And this difference of quickness is caused by the difference of men's passions, that love and dislike, some one thing, some another, and therefore some men's thoughts run one way, some another, and are held to observe differently the things that pass through their imagination. And whereas in this succession of men's thoughts there is nothing to observe in the things they think on, but either in what they be like one another, or in what they be unlike, or what they serve for, or how they serve to such a purpose, those that observe their similitudes, in case they be such as are but rarely observed by others, are said to have a good wit by which, in this occasion, is meant a good fancy. But they that observe their differences and dissimilitudes, which is called distinguishing and discerning and judging between thing and thing, in case such discerning be not easy, are said to have a good judgment, and particularly in matter of conversation and business, wherein times, places, and persons are to be discerned, this virtue is called discretion. The former, that is, fancy, without the help of judgment, is not commended as a virtue, but the latter which is judgment and discretion is commended for itself, without the help of fancy. Besides the discretion of times, places, and persons, necessary to a good fancy, there is required also an often application of his thoughts to their end, that is to say, to some use to be made of them. This done, he that hath this virtue will be easily fitted with similitudes that will please, not only by illustration of his discourse, and adorning it with new and apt metaphors, but also by the rarity of their invention. But without steadiness, and direction to some end, great fancy is one kind of madness, such as they have that, entering into any discourse, are snatched from their purpose by everything that comes in their thought, into so many and so long digressions and parentheses, that they utterly lose themselves, which kind of folly I know no particular name for, but the cause of it is sometimes want of experience, whereby that seemeth to a man new and rare, which doth not so to others. Sometimes pusillanimity, by which that seems great to him, which other men think a trifle, and whatsoever is new or great, and therefore thought fit to be told, withdraws a man by degrees from the intended way of his discourse. In a good poem, whether it be epic or dramatic, as also in sonnets, epigrams, and other pieces, both judgment and fancy are required. But the fancy must be more eminent, because they please for the extravagancy, but ought not to displease by indiscretion. In a good history, the judgment must be eminent, because the goodness consisteth in the choice of the method, in the truth, and in the choice of the actions, that are most profitable to be known. Fancy has no place, but only in adorning the style. In orations of praise, and in invectives, the fancy is predominant, because the design is not truth, but to honour or dishonour, which is done by noble or by vile comparisons. 
the judgment does but suggest what circumstances make an action laudable or culpable. In hortatives and pleadings, as truth or disguise serveth best to the design in hand, so is the judgment or the fancy most required. In demonstration, in counsel, and all rigorous search of truth, sometimes does all, except sometimes the understanding have need to be opened by some apt similitude, and then there is so much use of fancy. But for metaphors they are in this case utterly excluded. For seeing they openly profess deceit, to admit them into counsel, or reasoning, or manifest folly. And in any discourse whatsoever, if the defect of discretion be apparent, how extravagant soever the fancy be, the whole discourse will be taken for a sign of want of wit, and so will it never when the discretion is manifest, though the fancy be never so ordinary. The secret thoughts of a man run over all things holy, profane, clean, obscene, grave, and light, without shame or blame, which verbal discourse cannot do, farther than the judgment shall approve of the time, place, and persons. An anatomist or physician may speak or write his judgment of unclean things, because it is not to please, but profit. But for another man to write his extravagant and pleasant fancies of the same, is as if a man, for being tumbled into the dirt, should come and present himself before good company. And it is the want of discretion that makes the difference. Again, in professed remissness of mind, and familiar company, a man may play with the sounds and equivocal significations of words, and that many times with the encounters of extraordinary fancy. But in a sermon, or in public, or before persons unknown, or whom we ought to reverence, there is no jingling of words that will not be accounted folly, and the difference is only in the want of discretion. So that where wit is wanting, it is not fancy that is wanting, but discretion. Judgment, therefore, without fancy is wit, but fancy without judgment not. When the thoughts of a man that has a design in hand, running over a multitude of things, observes how they conduce to that design, or what design they may conduce unto, if his observations be such as are not easy or usual, this wit of his is called prudence, and dependeth on much experience, and memory of the like things and their consequences heretofore, in which there is not so much difference of men as there is in their fancies and judgments because the experience of men equal in age is not much unequal as to the quantity, but lies in different occasions, every one having his private designs. To govern well, a family and a kingdom are not different degrees of prudence, but different sorts of business. No more than to draw a picture in little, or as great or greater than the life, are different degrees of art. A plain husbandman is more prudent in affairs of his own house than a privy counsellor in the affairs of another man. To prudence, if you add the use of unjust or dishonest means, such as usually are prompted to men by fear or want, you have that crooked wisdom which is called craft, which is a sign of pusillanimity. For magnanimity is contempt of unjust or dishonest helps. And that which the Latins call versutia, translated into English, shifting, and is a putting off of a present danger or incommodity by engaging into a greater, as when a man robs one to pay another, is but a shorter-sighted craft called versutia, from versura, which signifies taking money at usury for the present payment of interest. As for acquired wit, I mean acquired by method and instruction, there is none but reason, which is grounded on the right use of speech, and produceth the sciences. But of reason and science I have already spoken in the fifth and sixth chapters. The causes of this difference of wits are in the passions, and the difference of passions proceedeth partly from the different constitution of the body, and partly from different education. For if the difference proceeded from the temper of the brain, and the organs of sense, either exterior or interior, there would be no less difference of men in their sight, hearing, or other senses, than in their fancies and discretions. It proceeds, therefore, from the passions, which are different not only from the difference of men's complexions, but also from their difference of customs and education. The passions that most of all cause the differences of wit are principally the more or less desire of power, of riches, of knowledge, and of honour. All which may be reduced to the first, that is, desire of power, for riches, knowledge, and honour are but several sorts of power. And therefore a man who has no great passion for any of these things, but is as men term it indifferent, though he may be so far a good man as to be free from giving offence, yet he cannot possibly have either a great fancy or much judgment. 
for the thoughts are to the desires as scouts and spies to range abroad and find the way to the things desired, all steadiness of the mind's motion, and all quickness of the same proceeding from thence. For as to have no desire is to be dead, so to have weak passions is dullness, and to have passions indifferently for everything, giddiness and distraction, and to have stronger and more vehement passions for anything that is ordinarily seen in others, is that which men call madness. Whereof there be almost as many kinds as of the passions themselves. Sometimes the extraordinary and extravagant passion proceedeth from the evil constitution of the organs of the body, or harm done them, and sometimes the hurt and indisposition of the organs is caused by the vehemence or long continuance of the passion, but in both cases the madness is of one and the same nature. The passion whose violence or continuance maketh madness is either great vainglory, which is commonly called pride and self-conceit, or great dejection of mind. Pride subjecteth a man to anger, the excess whereof is the madness called rage and fury. And thus it comes to pass that excessive desire of revenge, when it becomes habitual, hurteth the organs, and becomes rage, that excessive love with jealousy becomes also rage, excessive opinion of a man's own self, for divine inspiration, for wisdom, learning, form, and the like, becomes distraction and giddiness, the same joined with envy, rage, vehement opinion of the truth of anything, contradicted by others, rage. Dejection subjects a man to causeless fears, which is a madness commonly called melancholy, apparent also in diverse manners, as in haunting of solitudes and graves, in superstitious behavior, and in fearing some one, some another particular thing. In some, all passions that produce strange and unusual behavior are called by the general name of madness. But of the several kinds of madness, he that would take the pains might enroll a legion. And if the excesses be madness, there is no doubt but the passions themselves, when they tend to evil, are degrees of the same. For example, though the effect of folly in them that are possessed of an opinion of being inspired be not visible always in one man by any very extravagant action that proceedeth from such passion, yet when many of them conspire together, the rage of the whole multitude is visible enough. For what argument of madness can there be greater than to clamour, strike, and throw stones at our best friends? Yet this is somewhat less than such a multitude will do, for they will clamour, fight against, and destroy those by whom all their lifetime before they have been protected and secured from injury. And if this be madness in the multitude, it is the same in every particular man. For, as in the midst of the sea, though a man perceive no sound of that part of the water next him, yet he is well assured that part contributes as much to the roaring of the sea as any other part of the same quantity. So also, though we perceive no great unquietness in one or two men, yet we may be well assured that their singular passions are parts of the seditious roaring of a troubled nation. And if there were nothing else that berayed their madness, yet that very arrogating such inspiration to themselves is argument enough. If some man in Bedlam should entertain you with sober discourse, and you desire in taking leave to know what he were that you might another time requite his civility, and he should tell you he were God the Father, I think you need expect no extravagant action for argument of his madness. This opinion of inspiration, called commonly private spirit, begins very often from some lucky finding of an error generally held by others, and not knowing, or not remembering, by what conduct of reason they came to so singular a truth as they think it, though it be many times an untruth they light on, they presently admire themselves as being in the special grace of God Almighty, who hath revealed the same to them supernaturally by his Spirit. Again, that madness is nothing else but too much appearing passion may be gathered out of the effects of wine, which are the same with those of the evil disposition of the organs. For the variety of behaviour in men that have drunk too much is the same with that of madmen, some of them raging, others loving, others laughing, all extravagantly, but according to their several domineering passions. For the effect of the wine does but remove dissimulation, and take from them the sight of the deformity of their passions. For, I believe, the most sober men, when they walk alone without care and employment of the mind, would be unwilling the vanity and extravagance of their thoughts at that time should be publicly seen which is a confession that passions unguided are for the most part mere madness. The opinions of the world, both in ancient and later ages, concerning the cause of madness, have been two, some deriving them from the passions, some from demons or spirits, either good or bad, 
which they thought might enter into a man, possess him, and move his organs in such strange and uncouth manner as madmen used to do. The former sort, therefore, called such men madmen, but the latter called them sometimes demoniacs, that is, possessed with spirits, sometimes in ergumeni, that is, agitated or moved with spirits, and now in Italy they are called not only pazzi, madmen, but also spiritati, men possessed. There was once a great conflux of people in Abdera, a city of the Greeks, at the acting of the tragedy of Andromeda, upon an extreme hot day, whereupon a great many of the spectators, falling into fevers, had this accident from the heat and from the tragedy together, that they did nothing but pronounce iambics with the names of Perseus and Andromeda, which, together with a fever, was cured by the coming on of winter, and this madness was thought to proceed from the passion imprinted by the tragedy. Likewise there reigned a fit of madness in another Grecian city, which seized only the young maidens, and caused many of them to hang themselves. This was by most then thought an act of the devil. But one that suspected that contempt of life in them might proceed from some passion of the mind, and supposing they did not contemn also their honour, gave counsel to the magistrates to strip such as so hang themselves, and let them hang out naked. This, the story says, cured that madness. But on the other side, the same Grecians that often ascribe madness to the operation of the Eumenides, or Furies, and sometimes of Cirrus, Phoebus, and other gods, so much did men attribute to phantasms as to think them aerial living bodies, and generally to call them spirits. And as the Romans in this held the same opinion with the Greeks, so also did the Jews, for they called madmen prophets, or, according as they thought the spirits good or bad, demoniacs, and some of them called both prophets and demoniacs madmen, and some called the same man both demoniac and madman. But for the Gentiles it is no wonder, because diseases and health, vices and virtues, and many natural accidents, were with them termed and worshipped as demons. So that a man was to understand by demon as well, sometimes an ague, as a devil. But for the Jews to have such opinion is somewhat strange. For neither Moses nor Abraham pretended to prophesy by possession of a spirit, but from the voice of God, or by a vision or dream. Nor is there anything in his law, moral or ceremonial, by which they were taught there was any such enthusiasm, or any possession. When God is said to take from the spirit that was in Moses, and give to the seventy elders, the spirit of God, taking it for the substance of God, is not divided. The scriptures, by the spirit of God in man, mean a man's spirit inclined to godliness. And where it is said, Whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom to make garments for Aaron, is not meant a spirit put into them that can make garments, but the wisdom of their own spirits in that kind of work. In the like sense, the spirit of man, when it produceth unclean actions, is ordinarily called an unclean spirit, and so other spirits, though not always, yet as often as the virtue or vice, so styled, is extraordinary and eminent. Neither did the other prophets of the Old Testament pretend enthusiasm, or that God spoke in them, but to them, by voice, vision, or dream, and the burden of the Lord was not possession, but command. How then could the Jews fall into this opinion of possession? I can imagine no other reason but that which is common to all men, namely the want of curiosity to search natural causes, and their placing felicity in the acquisition of the gross pleasures of the senses, and the things that most immediately conduce thereto. For they that see any strange and unusual ability or defect in a man's mind, unless they see with all from what cause it may probably proceed, can hardly think it natural, and if not natural, they must needs think it supernatural, and then what can it be, but that either God or the devil is in him. And hence it came to pass, when our Saviour was compassed about with the multitude, those of the house doubted he was mad, and went out to hold him. But the scribes said he had Beelzebub, and that was it, by which he cast out devils, as if the greater madman had awed the lesser. And that some said, He hath the devil, and is mad, whereas others, holding him for a prophet, said, These are not the words of one that hath a devil. So in the Old Testament he that came to anoint Jehu was a prophet. But some of the company asked Jehu, What came that madman for? So that, in sum, it is manifest that whosoever behaved himself in extraordinary manner was thought by the Jews to be possessed either with a good or evil spirit, except by the Sadducees, who erred so far on the other hand as not to believe there were at all any spirits, which is very near to direct atheism and thereby perhaps the more provoked others to term such men demoniacs, rather than madmen. 
But why then does our Saviour proceed in the curing of them, as if they were possessed, and not as if they were mad? To which I can give no other kind of answer but that which is given to those who urge the Scripture in like manner against the opinion of the motion of the earth. The Scripture was written to show unto men the kingdom of God, and to prepare their minds to become his obedient subjects, leaving the world, and the philosophy thereof, to the disputation of men for the exercising of their natural reason. Whether the earth's or sun's motion make the day and night, or whether the exorbitant actions of men proceed from passion, or from the devil, so we worship him not, it is all one as to our obedience and subjection to God Almighty, which is the thing for which the scripture was written. As for that our Saviour speaketh to the disease as to a person, it is the usual phrase of all that cure by words only, as Christ did, and enchanters pretend to do, whether they speak to a devil or not. For is not Christ also said to have rebuked the winds? Is not he said also to rebuke a fever? Yet this does not argue that a fever is a devil. And whereas many of those devils are said to confess Christ, it is not necessary to interpret those places otherwise than that those madmen confessed him. And whereas our Saviour speaketh of an unclean spirit, that having gone out of a man wandereth through dry places, seeking rest and finding none, and returning into the same man with seven other spirits worse than himself, it is manifestly a parable, alluding to a man that, after a little endeavour to quit his lusts, is vanquished by the strength of them, and becomes seven times worse than he was. So that I see nothing at all in the scripture that requireth a belief that demoniacs were any other thing but madmen. There is yet another fault in the discourses of some men, which may also be numbered amongst the sorts of madness, namely that abuse of words whereof I have spoken before in the fifth chapter by the name of absurdity. And that is when men speak such words as, put together, have in them no signification at all, but are fallen upon, by some, through misunderstanding of the words they have received and repeat by rote, by others, from intention to deceive by obscurity. And this is incident to none but those that converse in questions of matters incomprehensible, as the schoolmen, or in questions of abstruse philosophy. The common sort of men seldom speak insignificantly, and are therefore, by those other egregious persons, counted idiots but to be assured their words are without anything correspondent to them in the mind, there would need some examples, which if any man require, let him take a schoolman into his hands, and see if he can translate any one chapter concerning any difficult point, as the Trinity, the Deity, the nature of Christ, transubstantiation, free will, etc., into any of the modern tongues, so as to make the same intelligible, or into any tolerable Latin, such as they were acquainted with all that lived when the Latin tongue was vulgar. What is the meaning of these words? The first cause does not necessarily inflow anything into the second, by force of the essential subordination of the second causes, by which it may help it to work. There the translation of the title of the sixth chapter of Suarez's first book, of the concourse, motion, and help of God. When men write whole volumes of such stuff, are they not mad, or intend to make others so? And particularly in the question of transubstantiation where, after certain words spoken, they that say the whiteness, roundness, magnitude, quality, corruptibility, all which are incorporeal, etc., go out of the wafer into the body of our blessed Saviour, do they not make those nesses, tudes, and ties to be so many spirits possessing his body? For by spirits they mean always things that, being incorporeal, are nevertheless movable from one place to another. So that this kind of absurdity may rightly be numbered amongst the many sorts of madness, and all the time that, guided by clear thoughts of their worldly lust, they forbear disputing or writing thus, but lucid intervals. And thus much are the virtues and defects intellectual. End of chapter 8 Recording by Darren L. Slider www.logoslibrary.org Chapter 9 of Leviathan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Carl Manchester, 2007. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Chapter 9 Of the several subjects of knowledge. There are of knowledge two kinds, whereof one is knowledge of fact, the other knowledge of the consequence of one affirmation to another. The former is nothing else but sense and memory, 
and is absolute knowledge, as when we see a fact doing, or remember it done, and this is the knowledge required in a witness. The latter is called science, and is conditional, as when we know that, if the figure shown be a circle, then any straight line through the centre shall divide it in two equal parts. And this is the knowledge required in a philosopher, that is to say, of him that pretends to reasoning. The register of knowledge of fact is called history, whereof there be two sorts, one called natural history, which is the history of such facts or effects of nature as have no dependence on man's will, such are the histories of metals, plants, animals, regions and the like. The other is civil history, which is the history of the voluntary actions of men in commonwealths. The registers of science are such books as contain the demonstrations of consequences of one affirmation to another, and are commonly called books of philosophy, whereof the sorts are many, according to the diversity of the matter, and may be divided in such manner as I have divided them in the following table. 1. Science, that is, knowledge of consequences, which is called also philosophy. 1. Consequences from accidents of bodies natural, which is called natural philosophy. 1. Consequences from accidents common to all bodies natural, which are quantity and motion. 1. Consequences from quantity and motion indeterminate, which, being the principle or first foundation of philosophy, is called philosophia prima. 2. Consequences from motion and quantity determined. 1. Consequences from quantity and motion determined by figure, by number, mathematics, geometry, arithmetic. 2. Consequences from motion and quantity of bodies in special. 1. Consequences from motion and quantity of the great parts of the world, as the earth and stars. Cosmography, astronomy, geography. 2. Consequences from motion of special kinds and figures of body. Mechanics, doctrine of weight. Science of engineers, architecture, navigation. Two, physics or consequences from qualities. One, consequences from qualities of bodies transient, such as sometimes appear, sometimes vanish. Meteorology. Two, consequences from qualities of bodies permanent. One, consequences from qualities of stars. One, consequences from the light of the stars. Out of this and the motion of the sun is made the science of seography. 2. Consequences from the influence of the stars. Astrology. 2. Consequences of qualities from liquid bodies that fill the space between the stars, such as are the air or substance ethereal. 3. Consequences from qualities of bodies terrestrial. 1. Consequences from parts of the earth that are without sense. 1. Consequences from qualities of minerals, as stones, metals, etc. 2. Consequences from the qualities of vegetables. 2. Consequences from qualities of animals. 1. Consequences from the qualities of animals in general. 1. Consequences from vision, optics. 2. Consequences from sounds, music. 3. Consequences from the rest of the senses. 2. Consequences from qualities of men in special. 1. Consequences from passions of men, ethics. 2. Consequences from speech. 1. In magnifying, vilifying, etc. Poetry. 2. In persuading, rhetoric. 3. In reasoning, logic. 4. In contracting, the science of just and unjust. 2. Consequences from accidents of politic bodies, which is called politics and civil philosophy. 1. Of consequences from the institution of commonwealths to the rights and duties of the body politic or sovereign. 2. Of consequences from the same to the duty and right of the subjects. End of chapter 9
Chapter Ten of Leviathan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes, Chapter Ten. Of power, worth, dignity, honour, and worthiness. The power of a man, to take it universally, is his present means to obtain some future apparent good, and is either original or instrumental. Natural power is the eminence of the faculties of body or mind, as extraordinary strength, form, prudence, arts, eloquence, liberality, nobility. Instrumental are those powers which, acquired by these, or by fortune, are means and instruments to acquire more, as riches, reputation, friends, and the secret working of God, which men call good luck. For the nature of power is, in this point, like to fame, increasing as it proceeds, or like the motion of heavy bodies, which, the further they go, make still the more haste. The greatest of human powers is that which is compounded of the powers of most men, united by consent in one person, natural or civil, that has the use of all their powers depending on his will, such as is the power of a commonwealth, or depending on the wills of each particular, such as is the power of a faction, or of diverse factions leagued. Therefore to have servants is power, to have friends is power, for they are strengths united. Also, riches joined with liberality is power, because it procureth friends and servants. Without liberality, not so, because in this case they defend not, but expose men to envy as a prey. Reputation of power is power, because it draweth with it the adherence of those that need protection. So is reputation of love of a man's country, called popularity, for the same reason. Also, what quality soever maketh a man beloved or feared of many, or the reputation of such quality, is power, because it is a means to have the assistance and service of many. Good success is power, because it maketh reputation of wisdom or good fortune, which makes men either fear him or rely on him. Affability of men already in power is increase of power, because it gaineth love. Reputation of prudence in the conduct of peace or war is power, because to prudent men we commit the government of ourselves more willingly than to others. Nobility is power, not in all places, but only in those commonwealths where it has privileges, for in such privileges consisteth their power. Eloquence is power, because it is seeming prudence. Form is power, because being a promise of good, it recommendeth men to the favour of women and strangers. The sciences are small powers, because not eminent, and therefore not acknowledged in any man, nor are at all but in a few, and in them but of a few things. For science is of that nature as none can understand it to be, but such as in a good measure have attained it. Arts of public use, as fortification, making of engines, and other instruments of war, because they confer to defence and victory, are power. And though the true mother of them be science, namely the mathematics, yet, because they are brought into the light by the hand of the artificer, they be esteemed, the midwife passing with the vulgar for the mother, as his issue. The value or worth of a man is, as of all other things, his price, that is to say, so much as would be given for the use of his power, and therefore is not absolute, but a thing dependent on the need and judgment of another. An able conductor of soldiers is of great price in time of war present or imminent, but in peace not so. A learned and uncorrupt judge is much worth in time of peace, but not so much in war and as in other things, so in men, not the seller, but the buyer, determines the price. 
For let a man, as most men do, rate themselves at the highest value they can, yet their true value is no more than it is esteemed by others. The manifestation of the value we set on one another is that which is commonly called honouring and dishonouring. To value a man at a high rate is to honour him, at a low rate is to dishonour him. But high and low in this case is to be understood by comparison to the rate that each man setteth on himself. The public worth of a man, which is the value set on him by the commonwealth, is that which men commonly call dignity. And this value of him by the commonwealth is understood by offices of command, judicature, public employment, or by names and titles introduced for distinction of such value. To pray to another for aid of any kind is to honour, because a sign we have an opinion he has power to help, and the more difficult the aid is, the more is the honour. To obey is to honour, because no man obeys them who they think have no power to help or hurt them, and consequently to disobey is to dishonour. To give great gifts to a man is to honour him, because it is buying of protection and acknowledging of power. To give little gifts is to dishonour, because it is but arms, and signifies an opinion of the need of small helps. To be sedulous in promoting another's good, also to flatter, is to honour, as a sign we seek his protection or aid. To neglect is to dishonour. To give way or place to another in any commodity is to honour, being a confession of greater power. To arrogate is to dishonour. To show any sign of love or fear of another is honour, for both to love and to fear is to value. To contemn, or less to love or fear than he expects, is to dishonour, for it is undervaluing. To praise, magnify, or call happy is to honour, because nothing but goodness, power, and felicity is valued. To revile, mock, or pity is to dishonour. To speak to another with consideration, to appear before him with decency and humility, is to honour him, as signs of fear to offend. To speak to him rashly, to do anything before him obscenely, slovenly, impudently, is to dishonour. To believe, to trust, to rely on another, is to honour him, sign of opinion of his virtue and power. To distrust or not believe, is to dishonour. To hearken to a man's counsel or discourse of what kind soever, is to honour, as a sign we think him wise, or eloquent, or witty. To sleep, or go forth, or talk the while, is to dishonour. To do those things to another which he takes for signs of honour, or which the law or custom makes so, is to honour, because in approving the honour done by others, he acknowledgeth the power which others acknowledge. To refuse to do them is to dishonour. To agree in opinion is to honour, as being a sign of approving his judgment and wisdom. To dissent is dishonour, and an upbraiding of error, and if the dissent be in many things, of folly. To imitate is to honour, for it is vehemently to approve. To imitate one's enemy is to dishonour. To honour those another honours is to honour him, as a sign of approbation of his judgment. To honour his enemies is to dishonour him. To employ in counsel or in actions of difficulty is to honour, as a sign of opinion of his wisdom or other power. To deny employment in the same cases to those that seek it is to dishonour. All these ways of honouring are natural, and as well within as without commonwealths. But in commonwealths, where he or they that have the supreme authority can make whatsoever they please to stand for signs of honour, there be other honours. A sovereign doth honour a subject with whatsoever title, or office, or employment, or action, that he himself will have taken for a sign of his will to honour him. The king of Persia honoured Mordecai, when he appointed he should be conducted through the streets in the king's garment, upon one of the king's horses, with a crown on his head, 
and a prince before him proclaiming, Thus shall it be done to him that the king will honour. And yet another king of Persia, or the same another time, to one that demanded for some great service to wear one of the king's robes, gave him leave so to do, but with this addition, that he should wear it as the king's fool, and then it was dishonour. So that of civil honour, the fountain is in the person of the commonwealth, and dependeth on the will of the sovereign, and is therefore temporary, and called civil honour, such as are magistracy, offices, titles, and in some places coats and scutcheons painted, and men honour such as have them, as having so many signs of favour in the commonwealth, which favour is power. Honourable is whatsoever possession, action, or quality is an argument and sign of power, and therefore to be honoured, loved, or feared of many is honourable, as arguments of power, to be honoured of few or none, dishonourable. Dominion and victory is honourable, because acquired by power, and servitude, for need or fear, is dishonourable. Good fortune, if lasting, honourable, as a sign of the favour of God. Ill and losses, dishonourable. Riches are honourable, for they are power. Poverty, dishonourable. Magnanimity, liberality, hope, courage, confidence are honourable, for they proceed from the conscience of power. Pusillanimity, parsimony, fear, diffidence are dishonourable. Timely resolution or determination of what a man is to do is honourable, as being the contempt of small difficulties and dangers, and irresolution dishonourable, as a sign of too much valuing of little impediments and little advantages. For when a man has weighed things as long as the time permits, and resolves not, the difference of weight is but little, and therefore if he resolve not, he overvalues little things, which is pusillanimity. All actions and speeches that proceed, or seem to proceed, from much experience, science, discretion, or wit, are honourable, for all these are powers. Actions or words that proceed from error, ignorance, or folly, dishonourable. Gravity, as far forth as it seems to proceed from a mind employed on something else, is honourable, because employment is a sign of power. But if it seem to proceed from a purpose to appear grave, it is dishonourable. For the gravity of the former is like the steadiness of a ship laden with merchandise, but of the latter like the steadiness of a ship ballasted with sand and other trash. To be conspicuous, that is to say, to be known, for wealth, office, great actions, or any eminent good, is honourable, as a sign of the power for which he is conspicuous. On the contrary, obscurity is dishonourable. To be descended from conspicuous parents is honourable, because they the more easily attain the aids and friends of their ancestors. On the contrary, to be descended from obscure parentage is dishonourable. Actions proceeding from equity, joined with loss, are honourable, as signs of magnanimity, for magnanimity is a sign of power. On the contrary, craft, shifting, neglect of equity, is dishonourable. Covetousness of great riches and ambition of great honours are honourable, as signs of power to obtain them. Covetousness and ambition of little gains or preferments is dishonourable. Nor does it alter the case of honour whether an action, so it be great and difficult and consequently a sign of much power, be just or unjust, for honour consisteth only in the opinion of power. Therefore the ancient heathen did not think they dishonoured, but greatly honoured the gods, when they introduced them in their poems committing rapes, thefts, and other great, but unjust or unclean acts, insomuch as nothing is so much celebrated in Jupiter as his adulteries, nor in Mercury as his frauds and thefts, of whose praises in a hymn of Homer the greatest is this, that being born in the morning he had invented music at noon, 
and before night stolen away the cattle of Apollo from his herdsmen. Also amongst men, till there were constituted great commonwealths, it was thought no dishonour to be a pirate or a highway thief, but rather a lawful trade, not only amongst the Greeks, but also amongst all other nations, as is manifest by the histories of ancient time. And at this day, in this part of the world, private duels are, and always will be, honourable, though unlawful, till such time as there shall be honour ordained for them that refuse, and ignominy for them that make the challenge. For duels also are many times effects of courage, and the ground of courage is always strength or skill, which are power, though for the most part they be effects of rash speaking, and of the fear of dishonour in one or both combatants, who, engaged by rashness, are driven into the lists to avoid disgrace. Scutcheons and coats of arms hereditary, where they have any eminent privileges, are honourable. Otherwise not, for their power consisteth either in such privileges, or in riches, or some such thing as is equally honoured in other men. This kind of honour, commonly called gentry, has been derived from the ancient Germans, for there never was any such thing known where the German customs were unknown, nor is it now anywhere in use where the Germans have not inhabited. The ancient Greek commanders, when they went to war, had their shields painted with such devices as they pleased, insomuch as an unpainted buckler was a sign of poverty and of a common soldier, but they transmitted not the inheritance of them. The Romans transmitted the marks of their families, but they were the images, not the devices, of their ancestors. Amongst the people of Asia, Africa, and America, there is not, nor was ever, any such thing. Germans only had that custom, from whom it has been derived into England, France, Spain, and Italy, when in great numbers they either aided the Romans, or made their own conquests in these western parts of the world. For Germany, being anciently, as all other countries in their beginnings, divided amongst an infinite number of little lords, or masters of families, that continually had wars one with another, those masters or lords, principally to the end they might, when they were covered with arms, be known by their followers, and partly for ornament, both painted their armour, or their scutcheon, or coat, with a picture of some beast or other thing, and also put some eminent and visible mark upon the crest of their helmets. And this ornament, both of the arms and crest, descended by inheritance to their children, to the eldest pure, and to the rest with some note of diversity, such as the old master, that is to say in Dutch, the Herre Alt, thought fit. But when many such families, joined together, made a greater monarchy, this duty of the herald, to distinguish scutcheons, was made a private office apart. And the issue of these lords is the great and ancient gentry, which for the most part bear living creatures noted for courage and rapine or castles, battlements, belts, weapons, bars, palisades, and other notes of war, nothing being then in honour but virtue military. Afterwards not only kings, but popular commonwealths, gave diverse manners of scutcheons to such as went forth to the war, or returned from it, for encouragement or recompense to their service. All which, by an observing reader, may be found in such ancient histories, Greek and Latin, as make mention of the German nation and manners in their times. Titles of honour, such as are Duke, Count, Marquis, and Baron, are honourable, as signifying the value set upon them by the sovereign power of the Commonwealth. Which titles were in old time titles of office and command, derived some from the Romans, some from the Germans and French? Dukes, in Latin duces, being generals in war, counts, comites, such as bore the general company out of friendship, and were left to govern and defend places conquered and pacified. Marquises, marchioness, were counts that governed the marches, or bounds of the empire. Which titles of duke, count, and marquis came into the empire about the time of Constantine the Great, 
from the customs of the German militia. But Baron seems to have been a title of the Gauls, and signifies a great man, such as were the kings or princes' men, whom they employed in war about their persons, and seems to be derived from Via, to bear, and Bar, that signified the same in the language of the Gauls, that Via in Latin, and thence to Bero and Baro, so that such men were called Berones, and after Baronis, and in Spanish Baronis. But he that would know more, particularly the original of titles of honour, may find it, as I have done this, in Mr. Selden's most excellent treatise of that subject. In process of time, these offices of honour, by occasion of trouble, and for reasons of good and peaceable government, were turned into mere titles, serving for the most part to distinguish the precedence, place, and order of subjects in the commonwealth, and men were made dukes, counts, marquises, and barons of places wherein they had neither possession nor command, and other titles also were devised to the same end. Worthiness is a thing different from the worth or value of a man, and also from his merit or desert, and consisteth in a particular power or ability, for that whereof he is said to be worthy, which particular ability is usually named fitness or aptitude. For he is worthiest to be a commander, to be a judge, or to have any other charge, that is best fitted with the qualities required to the well-discharging of it, and worthiest of riches, that has the qualities most requisite for the well-using of them. Any of which qualities being absent, one may nevertheless be a worthy man, and valuable for something else. Again, a man may be worthy of riches, office, and employment, that nevertheless can plead no right to have it before another, and therefore cannot be said to merit or deserve it. For merit presupposeth a right, and that the thing deserved is due by promise, of which I shall say more hereafter, when I shall speak of contracts. End of chapter 10Seven of Leviathan. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes. Chapter 11 Of the Difference of Manners. By manners, I mean not here decency of behaviour as how one man should salute another, or how a man should wash his mouth, or pick his teeth before company, and such other points of the small morals, but those qualities of mankind that concern their living together in peace and unity. To which end we are to consider that the felicity of this life consisteth not in the repose of a mind satisfied, for there is no such finis ultimus, utmost aim, nor summum bonum, greatest good, as is spoken of in the books of the old moral philosophers. Nor can a man any more live whose desires are at an end, than he whose senses and imaginations are at a stand. Felicity is a continual progress of the desire from one object to another, the attaining of the former being still but the way to the latter. The cause whereof is that the object of man's desire is not to enjoy once only, and for one instant of time, but to assure for ever the way of his future desire, and therefore the voluntary actions and inclinations of all men tend not only to the procuring, but also to the assuring of a contented life, and differ only in the way, which ariseth partly from the diversity of passions in diverse men, and partly from the difference of the knowledge or opinion each one has, of the causes which produce the effect desired. So that, in the first place, I put for a general inclination of all mankind, a perpetual and restless desire of power after power, that ceaseth only in death. And the cause of this is not always that a man hopes for a more intensive delight than he has already attained to, or that he cannot be content with a moderate power, but because he cannot assure the power and means to live well, which he hath present, without the acquisition of more. 
and from hence it is that kings, whose power is greatest, turn their endeavours to the assuring it at home by laws, or abroad by wars, and when that is done, there succeedeth a new desire, in some of fame from new conquest, in others of ease and sensual pleasure, in others of admiration, or being flattered for excellence in some art or other ability of the mind. Competition of riches, honour, command, or other power, inclineth to contention, enmity, and war, because the way of one competitor, to the attaining of his desire, is to kill, subdue, supplant, or repel the other. Particularly, competition of praise inclineth to a reverence of antiquity, for men contend with the living, not with the dead, to these ascribing more than due, that they may obscure the glory of the other. Desire of ease and sensual delight disposeth men to obey a common power, because by such desires a man doth abandon the protection that might be hoped for from his own industry and labour. Fear of death and wounds disposeth to the same, and for the same reason. On the contrary, needy men and hardy, not contented with their present condition, as also all men that are ambitious of military command, are inclined to continue the causes of war, and to stir up trouble and sedition, for there is no honour military but by war, nor any such hope to mend an ill game as by causing a new shuffle. Desire of knowledge and arts of peace inclineth men to obey a common power, for such desire containeth a desire of leisure, and consequently protection from some other power than their own. Desire of praise disposeth to laudable actions, such as please them whose judgment they value. For of those men whom we contemn, we contemn also the praises. Desire of fame after death does the same. And though after death there be no sense of the praise given us on earth, as being joys that are either swallowed up in the unspeakable joys of heaven, or extinguished in the extreme torments of hell, yet is not such fame vain, because men have a present delight therein, from the foresight of it, and of the benefit that may redound thereby to their posterity, which, though they now see not, yet they imagine, and anything that is pleasure in the sense, the same also is pleasure in the imagination. To have received from one, to whom we think ourselves equal, greater benefits than there is hope to requite, disposeth to counterfeit love, but really secret hatred, and puts a man into the estate of a desperate debtor, that, in declining the sight of his creditor, tacitly wishes him there, where he might never see him more. For benefits oblige, and obligation is thraldom, and unrequitable obligation, perpetual thraldom, which is to one's equal hateful. But to have received benefits from one whom we acknowledge for superior, inclines to love, because the obligation is no new depression, and cheerful acceptation, which men call gratitude, is such an honour done to the obliger as is taken generally for retribution. Also to receive benefits, though from an equal or inferior, as long as there is hope of requital, disposeth to love, for in the intention of the receiver the obligation is of aid and service mutual from whence proceedeth an emulation of who shall exceed in benefiting, the most noble and profitable contention possible, wherein the victor is pleased with his victory, and the other revenged by confessing it. To have done more hurt to a man than he can or is willing to expiate, inclineth the doer to hate the sufferer, for he must expect revenge or forgiveness, both which are hateful. Fear of oppression disposeth a man to anticipate or to seek aid by society, for there is no other way by which a man can secure his life and liberty. Men that distrust their own subtlety are in tumult and sedition better disposed for victory than they that suppose themselves wise or crafty. For these love to consult, the other, fearing to be circumvented, to strike first and in sedition, men being always in the precincts of battle, to hold together and use all advantages of force is a better stratagem than any that can proceed from subtlety of wit. 
Vainglorious men, such as without being conscious to themselves of great sufficiency, delight in supposing themselves gallant men, are inclined only to ostentation, but not to attempt, because when danger or difficulty appears, they look for nothing but to have their insufficiency discovered. Vainglorious men, such as estimate their sufficiency by the flattery of other men, or the fortune of some precedent action, without assured ground of hope from the true knowledge of themselves, are inclined to rash engaging, and in the approach of danger or difficulty to retire if they can, because, not seeing the way of safety, they will rather hazard their honour, which may be salved with an excuse, than their lives, for which no salve is sufficient. Men that have a strong opinion of their own wisdom in matter of government are disposed to ambition, because, without public employment in council or magistracy, the honour of their wisdom is lost. And therefore eloquent speakers are inclined to ambition, for eloquence seemeth wisdom, both to themselves and others. Pusillanimity disposeth men to irresolution, and consequently to lose the occasions and fittest opportunities of action. For after men have been in deliberation till the time of action approach, if it be not then manifest what is best to be done, it is a sign the difference of motives, the one way and the other, are not great. Therefore not to resolve then is to lose the occasion by weighing of trifles, which is pusillanimity. Frugality, though in poor men a virtue, maketh a man unapt to achieve such actions as require the strength of many men at once, for it weakeneth their endeavour, which is to be nourished and kept in vigour by reward. Eloquence, with flattery, disposeth men to confide in them that have it, because the former is seeming wisdom, the latter seeming kindness. Add to them military reputation, and it disposeth men to adhere and subject themselves to those men that have them. The two former, having given them caution against danger from him, the latter gives them caution against danger from others. Want of science, that is, ignorance of causes, disposeth, or rather constraineth a man, to rely on the advice and authority of others. For all men whom the truth concerns, if they rely not on their own, must rely on the opinion of some other, whom they think wiser than themselves, and see not why he should deceive them. Ignorance of the signification of words is want of understanding, disposeth men to take on trust, not only the truth they know not, but also the errors, and which is more, the nonsense of them they trust, for neither error nor nonsense can, without a perfect understanding of words, be detected. From the same it proceedeth that men give different names to one and the same thing, from the difference of their own passions, as they that approve a private opinion, call it opinion, but they that mislike it, heresy, and yet heresy signifies no more than private opinion, but has only a greater tincture of choler. From the same also it proceedeth that men cannot distinguish, without study and great understanding, between one action of many men, and many actions of one multitude, as, for example, between the one action of all the senators of Rome in killing Catiline, and the many actions of a number of senators in killing Caesar, and therefore are disposed to take for the action of the people that which is a multitude of actions done by a multitude of men, led perhaps by the persuasion of one. Ignorance of the causes and original constitution of right, equity, law, and justice disposeth a man to make custom and example the rule of his actions, in such manner as to think that unjust, which it hath been the custom to punish, and that just, of the impunity and approbation whereof they can produce an example, or, as the lawyers, which only use this false measure of justice, barbarously call it, a precedent like little children, that have no other rule of good and evil manners, but the correction they receive from their parents and masters, save that children are constant to their rule, whereas men are not so, because grown strong and stubborn, they appeal from custom to reason, and from reason to custom, as it serves their turn, receding from custom when their interest requires it, 
and setting themselves against reason as oft as reason is against them, which is the cause that the doctrine of right and wrong is perpetually disputed, both by the pen and the sword, whereas the doctrine of lines and figures is not so, because men care not in that subject what be truth, as a thing that crosses no man's ambition, profit, or lust. For I doubt not, but if it had been a thing contrary to any man's right of dominion, or to the interest of men that have dominion, that the three angles of a triangle should be equal to two angles of a square, that doctrine should have been, if not disputed, yet by the burning of all books of geometry, suppressed, as far as he whom it concerned was able. Ignorance of remote causes disposeth men to attribute all events to the causes immediate and instrumental, for these are all the causes they perceive. And hence it comes to pass that in all places men that are grieved with payments to the public discharge their anger upon the publicans, that is to say farmers, collectors, and other officers of the public revenue, and adhere to such as find fault with the public government and thereby, when they have engaged themselves beyond hope of justification, fall also upon the supreme authority for fear of punishment, or shame of receiving pardon. Ignorance of natural causes disposeth a man to credulity, so as to believe many times impossibilities, for such know nothing to the contrary, but that they may be true, being unable to detect the impossibility and credulity, because men love to be hearkened unto in company, disposeth them to lying, so that ignorance itself, without malice, is able to make a man both to believe lies and tell them, and sometimes also to invent them. Anxiety for the future time disposeth men to inquire into the causes of things, because the knowledge of them maketh men the better able to order the present to their best advantage. Curiosity, or love of the knowledge of causes, draws a man from consideration of the effect, to seek the cause, and again the cause of that cause, till of necessity he must come to this thought at last, that there is some cause whereof there is no former cause, but is eternal, which is it men call God. So that it is impossible to make any profound inquiry into natural causes, without being inclined thereby to believe there is one God eternal though they cannot have any idea of him in their mind, answerable to his nature. For as a man that is born blind, hearing men talk of warming themselves by the fire, and being brought to warm himself by the same, may easily conceive and assure himself there is somewhat there which men call fire, and is the cause of the heat he feels, but cannot imagine what it is like, nor have an idea of it in his mind, such as they have that see it, so also, by the visible things of this world, and their admirable order, a man may conceive there is a cause of them, which men call God, and yet not have an idea or image of him in his mind. And they that make little or no inquiry into the natural causes of things, yet from the fear that proceeds from the ignorance itself of what it is that hath the power to do them much good or harm, are inclined to suppose, and feign unto themselves several kinds of powers invisible, and to stand in awe of their own imaginations, and in time of distress to invoke them, as also in the time of an expected good success to give them thanks, making the creatures of their own fancy their gods. By which means it hath come to pass that from the innumerable variety of fancy men have created in the world innumerable sorts of gods, and this fear of things invisible is the natural seed of that which every one in himself calleth religion, and in them that worship or fear that power otherwise than they do, superstition. And this seed of religion, having been observed by many, some of those that have observed it have been inclined thereby to nourish, dress, and form it into laws, and to add to it, of their own invention, any opinion of the causes of future events by which they thought they should best be able to govern others, and make unto themselves the greatest use of their powers. End of chapter 11
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes Chapter 12 Of Religion Seeing there are no signs nor fruit of religion but in man only, there is no cause to doubt but that the seed of religion is also only in man, and consisteth in some peculiar quality, or at least in some eminent degree thereof, not to be found in other living creatures. And first, it is peculiar to the nature of man to be inquisitive into the causes of the events they see, some more, some less, but all men so much as to be curious in the search of the causes of their own good and evil fortune. Secondly, upon the side of anything that hath a beginning, to think also it had a cause which determined the same to begin then when it did, rather than sooner or later. Thirdly, whereas there is no other felicity of beasts, but the enjoying of their quotidian food, ease, and lusts, as having little or no foresight of the time to come, for want of observation and memory of the order, consequence, and dependence of the things they see, man observeth how one event hath been produced by another, and remembereth in them antecedents and consequence, and when he cannot assure himself of the true causes of things, for the causes of good and evil fortune for the most part are invisible, he supposes causes of them either such as his own fancy suggesteth, or trusteth to the authority of other men, such as he thinks to be his friends, and wiser than himself. The two first make anxiety, for, being assured that there be causes of all things that have arrived hitherto, or shall arrive hereafter, it is impossible for a man, who continually endeavoureth to secure himself against the evil he fears, and procure the good he desireth, not to be in a perpetual solicitude of the time to come, so that every man, especially those that are over-provident, are in an estate like that to be of Prometheus. For as Prometheus, which interpreted is the prudent man, was bound to the hill Caucasus, a place of large prospect, where an eagle feeding on his liver, devoured in the day as much as was repaired in the night, so that man, which looks too far before him, in the care of future time, hath his heart all the day long gnawed on by fear of death, poverty, or other calamity, and has no repose, nor pause of his anxiety, but in sleep. This perpetual fear, always accompanying mankind in the ignorance of causes, as it were in the dark, must needs have for object something. And therefore, when there is nothing to be seen, there is nothing to accuse either of their good or evil fortune, but some power or agent invisible in which sense perhaps it was, that some of the old poets said that the gods were at first created by human fear, which, spoken of the gods, that is to say, of the many gods of the Gentiles, is very true. But the acknowledging of one god, eternal, infinite, and omnipotent, may more easily be derived from the desire men have to know the causes of natural bodies, and their several virtues and operations, than from the fear of what was to befall them in time to come. For he that, from any effect he seeth come to pass, should reason to the next and immediate cause thereof, and from thence to the cause of that cause, and plunge himself profoundly in the pursuit of causes, shall at last come to this, that there must be, as even the heathen philosophers confessed, one first mover, that is, a first and eternal cause of all things, which is that which men mean by the name of God, and all this without thought of their fortune, the solicitude whereof both inclines to fear, and hinders them from the search of their causes of other things, and thereby gives occasion of feigning of as many gods as there be men to feign them. And for the matter or substance of the invisible agents so fancied, they could not by natural cogitation fall upon any other concept but that it was the same with that of the soul of man, and that the soul of man was of the same substance with that which appeareth in a dream to one that sleepeth or in a looking-glass to one that is awake, which, men not knowing that such apparitions are nothing else but the creatures of the fancy, think to be real and external substances, and therefore call them ghosts, as the Latins called them imagines, and umbri, and thought them spirits, that is, thin aerial bodies, and those invisible agents which they feared to be like them, save that they appear and vanish when they please. 
but the opinion that such spirits were incorporeal or immaterial could never enter into the mind of any man by nature because though men may put together words of contradictory signification as spirit and incorporeal yet they can never have the imagination of anything answering to them and therefore men that by their own meditation arrive to the acknowledgment of one infinite omnipotent and eternal god choose rather to confess he is incomprehensible and above their understanding than to define his nature by spirit incorporeal and then confess their definition to be unintelligible or if they give him such a title it is not dogmatically with intention to make the divine nature understood but piously to honor him with attributes of significations as remote as they can be from the grossness of bodies visible then for the way by which men think that these invisible agents wrought their effects that is to say what immediate causes they used in bringing things to pass men that know not what it is we call causing that is almost all men have no other rule to guess by but by observing and remembering what they have seen to proceed the like effect at some other time or times before without seeing between the antecedent and subsequent event any dependence or connection at all and therefore from the like things past they expect the like things to come and hope for good or evil luck superstitiously from things that have no part at all in the causing of it as the athenians did for their war at lepanto demand another formio the pompeian faction for their war in africa another scipio and others have done in diverse other occasions since in like manner they attribute their fortune to a stander-by to a lucky or unlucky place to words spoken especially if the name of god be amongst them as charming and conjuring the liturgy of witches insomuch as to believe they have power to turn a stone into bread bread into a man or anything into anything thirdly for the worship which naturally men exhibit to powers invisible it can be no other but such expressions of their reverence as they would use towards men gifts petitions thanks submission of body considerate addresses sober behavior premeditated words swearing that is assuring one another of their promises by invoking them beyond that reason suggesteth nothing but leaves them either to rest there or for further ceremonies to rely on those they believe to be wiser than themselves lastly concerning how these invisible powers declare to men the things which shall hereafter come to pass especially concerning their good or evil fortune in general or good or ill success in any particular undertaking men are naturally at a stand save that using the conjecture of the time to come by the time past they are very apt not only to take casual things after one or two encounters for prognostics of the like encounter ever after but also to believe the like prognostics from other men of whom they have once conceived a good opinion and in these four things opinion of ghosts ignorance of second causes devotion towards what men fear and taking of things casual for prognostics consisteth the natural seed of religion which by reason of the different fancies judgments and passions of several men hath grown up into ceremonies so different that those which are used by one man are for the most part ridiculous to another for these seeds have received culture from two sorts of men one sort have been that they have nourished and ordered them according to their own invention the other have done it by god's commandment and direction but both sorts have done it with a purpose to make those men that relied on them the more apt to obedience laws peace charity and civil society so that the religion of the former sort is a part of human politics and teacheth part of the duty which earthly kings require of their subjects and the religion of the latter sort is divine politics and containeth precepts to those that have yielded themselves subjects in the kingdom of god of the former sort were all the founders of the commonwealths and the lawgivers of the gentiles of the latter sort were abraham moses and our blessed saviour by whom have been derived unto us the laws of the kingdom of god and for that part of religion which consisteth in opinions concerning the nature of powers invisible there is almost nothing that has a name that has not been esteemed among the gentiles in one place or another a god or devil or by their poets feigned to be animated inhabited or possessed by some spirit or other the unformed matter of the world was a god by the name of chaos 
The heaven, the ocean, the planets, the fire, the earth, the winds, were so many gods. Men, women, a bird, a crocodile, a calf, a dog, a snake, an onion, a leek, were deified. Besides that, they filled almost all places with spirits called demons. The plains with Pan and Panices, or satyrs, the woods with fauns and nymphs, the sea with tritons and other nymphs, every river and fountain with a ghost of his name and with nymphs, every house with its lares or familiars, every man with his genius, hell with ghosts and spiritual officers, as Charon, Cerberus, and the Furies, and in the night time all places with larvae, lemures, ghosts of men deceased, and a whole kingdom of fairies and bugbears. They have also ascribed divinity, and built temples, to mere accidents and qualities, such as are time, night, day, peace, concord, love, contention, virtue, honor, health, rust, fever, and the like, which, when they prayed for or against, they prayed as if there were ghosts of those names hanging over their heads, and letting fall or withholding that good or evil for or against which they prayed. They invoked also their own wit by the name of Muses, their own ignorance by the name of Fortune, their own lust by the name of Cupid, their own rage by the name Furies, their own privy members by the name of Priapus, and attributed their pollutions to incubi and succubi, insomuch as there was nothing which a poet could introduce as a person in his poem which they did not make either a god or a devil. The same authors of the religion of the Gentiles, observing the second ground for religion, which is men's ignorance of causes, and thereby their aptness to attribute their fortune to causes on which there was no dependence at all apparent, took occasion to obtrude on their ignorance, instead of second causes, a kind of second and ministerial gods, ascribing the cause of fecundity to Venus, the cause of arts to Apollo, of subtlety and craft to Mercury, of tempests and storms to Aeolus, and of other effects to other gods, insomuch as there was among the heathen almost as great variety of gods as of business. And to the worship, which naturally men conceive fit to be used toward their gods, namely oblations, prayers, thanks, and the rest formerly named, the same legislators of the Gentiles have added their images, both in picture and sculpture, that the more ignorant sort, that is to say, the most part of the generality of the people, thinking the gods for whose representation they were made were really included, and as it were housed within them, might so much the more stand in fear of them, and endowed them with lands and houses and officers and revenues, set apart from all other human uses, that is, consecrated, made holy to those their idols, as caverns, groves, woods, mountains, and whole islands, and have attributed to them not only the shape, some of men, some of beasts, some of monsters, but also the faculties and passions of men and beasts, as sense, speech, sex, lust, generation, and this not only by mixing one with another to propagate the kind of gods, but also by mixing with men and women to beget mongrel gods, and but inmates of heaven as Bacchus, Hercules, and others. Besides anger, revenge, and other passions of living creatures, and the actions proceeding from them, as fraud, theft, adultery, sodomy, and any vice that may be taken for an effect of power or a cause of pleasure, and all such vices as amongst men are taken to be against law rather than against honor. Lastly, to the prognostics of time to come, which are naturally but conjectures upon the experience of time past, and supernaturally divine revelation, the same authors of the religion of the Gentiles, partly upon pretended experience, partly upon pretended revelation, have added innumerable other superstitious ways of divination, and made men believe that they should find their fortunes, sometimes in the ambiguous or senseless answers of the priests at Delphi, Delos, Ammon, and other famous oracles which answers were made ambiguous by design, to own the event both ways, or absurd by the intoxicating vapor of the place, which is very frequent in sulphurous caverns, sometimes in the leaves of the sibyls, of whose prophecies, like those perhaps of Nostradamus, for the fragments now extant seem to be the invention of later times, there were some books in reputation in the time of the Roman Republic, sometimes in the insignificant speeches of madmen, supposed to be possessed with a divine spirit, which possession they called enthusiasm, 
and these kinds of foretelling events were accounted theomancy, or prophecy, sometimes in the aspect of the stars at their nativity, which was called horoscopy, and esteemed a part of judiciary astrology, sometimes in their own hopes and fears, called thumomancy, or presage, sometimes in the prediction of witches that pretended conference with the dead, which is called necromancy, conjuring and witchcraft, and is but juggling and confederate knavery, sometimes in the casual flight or feeding of birds, called augury, sometimes in the entrails of a sacrificed beast, which was heruspicy, sometimes in dreams, sometimes in croaking of ravens or chattering of birds, sometimes in the lineaments of the face, which was called metaposcopy, or by palmistry in the lines of the hand, in casual words called amina, sometimes in monsters or unusual accidents, as eclipses, comets, rare meteors, earthquakes, inundations, uncouth births, and the like, which they called portenta and ostenta, because they thought them to portend or foreshow some great calamity to come, sometimes in mere lottery, as cross and pile, counting holes in a sieve, dipping of verses in Homer and Virgil, and innumerable other such vain conceits. So easy are men to be drawn to believe anything from such men as have gotten credit with them, and can with gentleness and dexterity take hold of their fear and ignorance. And therefore the first founders and legislators of commonwealths amongst the Gentiles, whose ends were only to keep the people in obedience and peace, have in all places taken care. First, to imprint their minds a belief that those precepts which they gave concerning religion might not be thought to proceed from their own device, but from the dictates of some god or other spirit, or else that they themselves were of a higher nature than mere mortals, that their laws might the more easily be received. So Numa Pompilius pretended to receive the ceremonies he instituted amongst the Romans from the nymph Egeria, and the first king and founder of the kingdom of Peru pretended himself and his wife to be the children of the sun. And Mahomet, to set up his new religion, pretended to have conferences with the Holy Ghost in form of a dove. Secondly, they have had a care to make it believed that the same things were displeasing to the gods which were forbidden by the laws. Thirdly, to prescribe ceremonies, supplications, sacrifices, and festivals by which they were to believe the anger of the gods might be appeased, and that ill success in war, great contagions of sickness, earthquakes, and each man's private misery came from the anger of the gods, and their anger from the neglect of their worship, or the forgetting or mistaking some point of the ceremonies required. And though amongst the ancient Romans, men were not forbidden to deny that which in the poets is written of the pains and pleasures after this life, which divers of great authority and gravity in that state have in their harangues openly derided, yet that belief was always more cherished than the contrary. And by these, and such other institutions, they obtained in order to their end, which was the peace of the commonwealth, that the common people in their misfortunes, laying the fault on neglect or error in their ceremonies, or on their own disobedience to the laws, were the less apt to mutiny against their governors. And, being entertained with the pomp and pastime of festivals and public games, made in honor of the gods, needed nothing else but bread, to keep them from discontent, murmuring, and commotion against the state. And therefore the Romans, that had conquered the greatest part of the then known world, made no scruple of tolerating any religion whatsoever in the city of Rome itself, unless it had something in it that could not consist with their civil government. Nor do we read that any religion was there forbidden but that of the Jews, who, being the peculiar kingdom of God, thought it unlawful to acknowledge subjection to any mortal king or state whatsoever. And thus you see how the religion of the Gentiles was a part of their policy. But where God himself, by supernatural revelation, planted religion, there he also made to himself a peculiar kingdom, and gave laws, not only of behavior toward himself, but also towards one another. And thereby, in the kingdom of God, the policy and law civil are a part of religion. And therefore the distinction of temporal and spiritual domination hath there no place. It is true that God is king of all the earth, yet he may be king of a peculiar and chosen nation. 
for there is no more incongruity therein than that he that hath the general command of the whole army should have withal a peculiar regiment or company of his own. God is king of all the earth by his power, but of his chosen people he is king by covenant. But to speak more largely of the kingdom of God, both by nature and covenant, I have in the following discourse assigned another place. From the propagation of religion, it is not hard to understand the causes of the resolution of the same into its first seeds or principles, which are only an opinion of a deity, and powers invisible and supernatural. That can never be so abolished out of human nature, but that new religions may again be made to spring out of them, by the culture of such men as for such purpose are in reputation. For seeing all formed religion is founded at first upon the faith which a multitude hath in some one person, whom they believe not only to be a wise man, and to labor to procure their happiness, but also to be a holy man, to whom God himself vouchsafeth to declare his will supernaturally, it followeth necessarily, when they that have the government of religion shall come to have either the wisdom of those men, their sincerity, or their love suspected, or that they shall be unable to show any probable token of divine revelation, that the religion which they desire to uphold must be suspected likewise, and, without the fear of the civil sword, contradicted and rejected. That which taketh away the reputation of wisdom in him that formeth a religion, or addeth to it when it is already formed, is the enjoining of a belief of contradictories. For both parts of a contradiction cannot possibly be true, and therefore to enjoin the belief of them is an argument of ignorance, which detects the author in that, and discredits him in all things else he shall propound as from revelation supernatural, which revelation a man may indeed have of many things above, but of nothing against natural reason. That which taketh away the reputation of sincerity is the doing or saying of such things as appear to be signs that what they require other men to believe is not believed by themselves. All which doings or sayings are therefore called scandalous, because they be stumbling-blocks that make men to fall in the way of religion, as injustice, cruelty, profaneness, avarice, and luxury. For who can believe that he that doth ordinarily such actions, as proceed from any of these roots, believeth there is any such invisible power to be feared, as he affrighteth other men withal for lesser faults. That which taketh away the reputation of love is the being detected of private ends, as when the belief they require of others conduceth, or seemeth to conduce, to the requiring of dominion, riches, dignity, or secure pleasure to themselves only or specially. For that which men reap benefit by to themselves, they are thought to do for their own sakes, and not for the love of others. Lastly, the testimony that men can render of divine calling can be no other than the operation of miracles, or true prophecy, which is also a miracle, or extraordinary felicity. And therefore, to those points of religion which have been received from them that did such miracles, those that are added by such as approve not their calling by some miracle, obtain no greater belief than what the custom and laws of the places in which they be educated have wrought into them. For, as in natural things men of judgment require natural signs and arguments, so in supernatural things they require signs supernatural, which are miracles, before they consent inwardly and from their hearts. All which causes of the weakenings of men's faith do manifestly appear in the examples following. First, we have the example of the children of Israel, who, when Moses, that had approved his calling to them by miracles, and by the happy conduct of them out of Egypt, was absent but forty days, revolted from the worship of the true God recommended to them by him, and setting up, Exodus 32, 1-2, a golden calf for their God, relapsed into the idolatry of the Egyptians, from whom they had been so lately delivered. And again, after Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and that generation which had seen the great works of God in Israel were dead, another generation arose and served Baal. Judges 2.11 So that miracles failing, faith also failed. Again, when the sons of Samuel, being constituted by their father judges in Beersheba, received bribes and judged unjustly, the people of Israel refused any more to have God to be their king in other manner than he was king of other people 
and therefore cried out to Samuel to choose them a king after the manner of the nations. 1 Samuel 8.3 So that justice failing, faith also failed, insomuch as they deposed their God from reigning over them. And whereas in the planting of Christian religion, the oracle ceased in all parts of the Roman Empire, and the number of Christians increased wonderfully every day, and in every place by the preaching of the apostles and evangelists, a great part of that success may reasonably be attributed to the contempt into which the priests of the Gentiles of that time had brought themselves by their uncleanness, avarice, and juggling between princes. Also, the religion of the Church of Rome was partly for the same cause abolished in England and many other parts of Christendom, insomuch as the failing of virtue in the pastors maketh faith fail in the people, and partly from bringing of the philosophy and doctrine of Aristotle into religion by the schoolmen, from whence there arose so many contradictions and absurdities as brought the clergy into a reputation both of ignorance and of fraudulent intention, and inclined people to revolt from them, either against the will of their own princes, as in France and Holland, or with their will, as in England. Lastly, amongst the points by the Church of Rome declared necessary for salvation, there be so many manifestly to the advantage of the Pope, so many of his spiritual subjects residing in the territories of other Christian princes, that, were it not for the mutual emulation of those princes, they might, without war or trouble, exclude all foreign authority, as easily as it has been excluded in England. For who is there that does not see to whose benefit it conduceth, to have it believed that a king hath not his authority from Christ, unless a bishop crown him, that a king, if he be a priest, cannot marry, that, whether a prince be born in lawful marriage or not, must be judged by authority from Rome, that subjects may be freed from their allegiance, if by the court of Rome the king be judged a heretic, that a king, as Childeric of France, may be deposed by a pope, as Pope Zachary, for no cause, and his kingdom given to one of his subjects, that the clergy and regulars, in what country soever, shall be exempt from the jurisdiction of their king in cases criminal. Or who does not see to whose profit redound the fees of private masses, and the values of purgatory, with other signs of private interest enough to mortify the most lively faith, if, as I have said, the civil magistrate in custom did not more sustain it than any opinion they have of the sanctity, wisdom, or probity of their teachers. So that I may attribute all the changes of religion in the world to one and the same cause, and that is unpleasing priests, and those not only amongst Catholics, but even in that church that hath presumed most of reformation. End of chapter 12